Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janeri and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, Mesopotamia and Babylon. Mesopotamia is literally the land between two rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means. And those two rivers are the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Tigris is the northern river and the Euphrates is the southern one. And the Euphrates is the more important of the two. It's the great border. It's slower moving. It's where more of the cities will be based. The Euphrates is the more important of the two rivers. Now, there's also a north and a south to Mesopotamia. And that is the um, Taurus Mountains that form the border between Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and what is Syria and Iraq today. And the rivers lead into the Persian Gulf. And so Mesopotamia did not include all of the Middle East. It didn't include the mountains north of the Tigris. That becomes Persia, later Iran. Actually, it's probably Media and then later Iran. Or the deserts to the south, which will be Arabia. It does include, Mesopotamia did include, especially culturally, the Levant. The the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And this is where in textbooks, especially in elementary school, you'll see the, the Fertile Crescent. This, this um, drawing that will go from the Sinai Desert up to Asia Minor and then come back down to uh, through the Tigris and Euphrates down to the Persian Gulf. And they'll go, that's the where civilization began. That's the Fertile Crescent. And culturally, that's all true. But Mesopotamia is where the earliest cities started. And they start at the bottom of the river in a place called Sumer. And while there are cities older, Sumer really begins around 3000 BCE as a cultural place. And so what did it mean to live in Sumer? Well, it meant you had land, it meant civilization. You had land, you could make money if you owned land, but there were rules, there were kings, there were laws. So you had civilization. Success, if cities were successful, you built some super cities, Ur and Uruk, and these cities had 30,000 people in them. And that was considered big. A typical city is around 5,000 people. So Ur and Uruk and some of the super cities at 30,000 were very successful. But what if you wanted land? What if you wanted freedom? What if you didn't want a king to tell you what to do? Well, then you went upriver. You moved. And the rivers became the frontiers. Then you went up the river, started a farm, found some land. And you start a farm. And then, ironically, you made a government. Why? Because of nomads. So you left the places of protection because you didn't have access to a lot of land. You didn't have access to money. You didn't have um, access to freedoms. And so you left that civilization to move to the frontier. And in the end, had to rebuild civilization to protect you from violence. That is not a surprise. That's exactly how the United States built itself. Colonists start in the east and poorer colonists move further west. They want land. They want um, money. They want freedom. They want adventure. And what happens is they run into the native indigenous peoples, the first peoples, who are like, this is our land, and so there's war. And so to make protection against those indigenous people, the colonists rebuild the civilization of the eastern United States. They build the forts, they build the cities, they build the walls, they build the government. They build, And so as they move west, you get territories and then states. You get the organization. 
So you move up the river, which is the frontier. You start a farm. You need protection. So you make a government. That creates a city. That city will be about 5,000 people. If that city is very successful, it will grow to around 30,000 people. And then people will run out of land, run out of uh, patience with the governments, and they'll move further north. And so civilization moves up the rivers towards the mountains. And so Sumer becomes leads into Akkad, which is in the middle of the rivers. And Akkad leads to the frontier, which is later known as Assyria. And then you get to the mountains. And on the other side of the mountains are a different people, a non-Mesopotamian people known as the Hittites. The northern mountains equal the border with the Hittites, who are a different people. They're a mountain people. And their wealth is based on minerals, on trade, and not on river valley farming. So what does all this development bring? Well, we talked about how it brought war, war between these cities to expand, how Ur and Uruk become super cities, partly by war. And eventually what you get is Sargon. If it wasn't Sargon, it would be somebody else, but you get a person who decides he's going to conquer all of the cities. And that is Sargon of Akkad, around 2400 BC. You get the rise of the imperialist king, and that's Sargon, he's the first conqueror of the known world. He's the first guy who could look at a map and say, I own all of this. From sea to sea, from Mesopotamia to Persian Gulf. Well, how did he do it? He did it with a mercenary army. He hired soldiers, he hired professional soldiers. He hired professional guys who knew how to fight to be in his army. And he had this army of 5,000 professional soldiers, which was considered enormous in its day. Now, we'll see how that's not very big uh, in the end, but in the earliest days, that's huge. And it costs an enormous amount of money. Mercenaries are incredibly expensive. They're professionals. They want to be paid. Now, they're not a professional army. They're not a full-time like a modern army that is always standing there. They only fight for pay. So you hire them and then you pay them and then you let them go. Um, but what Sargon found is it costs a lot of money, but if you win, you can make a lot more money by levying taxes on the cities that you conquer and not taking the land. Remember, we talked about how you would take the land of the neighbor so that your farmers can take over someone else's farms. Well, Sargon realized, and he's not the first to realize this, but his empire will work this way, that you don't have to move people around. You don't have to take people's lands if you don't want to. You just levy taxes on them and you move the money around and you can make a lot more money because kings always get to charge a tax on that. They always get to take 10% to 15% off the top. And so... He financed his army by conquering new places, which paid for previous wars, which meant he had an empire of no peace. It was war all the time. And so what we get is a new form of legitimacy. Legitimacy used to be protection, right? You build the walls, you charge taxes, and you, you build the walls, you build temples, you hire priests. You protect people from bad things happening. Now, Sargon invents a new form of legitimacy, and that is subjugation, the conqueror. And this will be some of the most famous non-religious peoples in history. Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, the great conquerors, the great battle leaders, the great warlords, King Arthur. Charlemagne. And so this new form of legitimacy is going to be in some ways an apex idea of what a king could be. 
A king could protect his people, quote unquote protect, by conquering all their enemies. So, and get famous and get rich doing it. Well, there are problems with the mercenary armies and problems with creating empires. One, people don't like being conquered. They really don't like enriching others. People may hate you unless you do something that gets you legitimacy with people who aren't your people. So Sargon had Akkad and he kept winning battles. And that was great for the people of Akkad. They got rich. But if you were conquered, you looked at Sargon and said he was a, a jerk. An SOB. You didn't like him. And that's going to be a problem for Sargon because people may revolt. They may gang up on you. They may hire their own mercenary armies. So you have to do something. You don't have to, but a lot of kings will, and we'll see this, will do something that says, okay, 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 okay. I beat you up, but look at all the stuff I'll do for you now. This is very true of the Romans. Because the idea is now let's try to make this empire work. Other peoples like the Assyrians don't. They say, I've, I'll punch you in the face again. Mercenary armies are very expensive and they're not loyal. They will fight for anybody. So few kings can afford them. And Sargon had to conquer the world or be conquered by it. He was afraid that if he ever stopped paying his army, they would go work for somebody else and that person would then use that army against him. And so he couldn't let the army go. He couldn't ever have peace because the moment he had peace, the army would be hired by other people to start a new war. So there's the irony of, of violence, right? Once you start violence, it's hard to stop. We'll see this in especially 102, where wars begin and they're hard to end. We'll see this with racism and slavery, that once you start a cycle of violence, it is incredibly hard to stop it because the people who commit the violence actually are afraid that the violence one day will come back on them. This is a core piece of racism. This is a core piece of slavery. The fear that the people who you treat badly will one day be in charge and treat you the same way. So how do you run an empire? How do you make it and how do you run it? Well, you need good rulers. You can't be a good ruler and conquer the world. Well, you can't be a bad ruler, excuse me, and conquer the world. You have to be a good ruler. And how do you keep all these different people? How do you keep 70 different cities all together in an empire? and not have it break apart, you need to be a good ruler to keep it or to force it together. And so those rulers are few and far between because it's hard work being an emperor. It's hard work being, it's hard work being a good king, much less a good emperor. Think of them as like LeBron or Jordan in basketball or, you know, a, a, a Hall of Fame quarterback in in uh football you know they're they they're rare they're, there's just not that many and so when sargon dies his his sons are okay some of them are okay but it starts to break up it doesn't fully fall apart for about a hundred years or so but it starts to like the farthest regions of the of the empire go you know I'm not going to listen to you. They become like teenagers. Okay, I, I heard what you said, and I'm still going to do what I want. Why? Because now the now the thing is now now the the dare is 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 the child's dare, right? So the emperor, the new emperor, says, "Do this." And this guy, this king, some in some city, says, "Come up here and make me." And that's how empires fall apart. Because Sargon could go and do it. 
but not everybody else can. You got to get your army together. You got to march up the river. It's going to take you a year, six months to get up there. You're going to have to fight a battle or lay a siege. You're going to have to keep the army together. You're going to, you're going to have to have the army be loyal to you. So you have to be charismatic. You have to have money. You have to have an endless supply of money to pay these guys. If it's a siege, it's even worse. If you fight a battle, you might lose. And if you lose, then you're humiliated and lots of other cities start going, oh, he's not so tough. So if battle is a risk, and so dude, if you come at the king, you best not miss. You got to mean it if you want to make an empire. Look at Napoleon. As long as Napoleon kept winning, he could conquer Europe. The moment he lost in Russia, everything fell apart. And that brings us to Babylon. In the center in Akkad, in the region of Cold Akkad, a new city is developing as Sargon's empire is breaking apart. So Sargon's dead. You know, Sargon could hold his empire together. He died. But as he died, when he died or after he died, there's this town in the middle of of Mesopotamia. It's kind of halfway north and south. It's also, it's halfway up and down the river, north and south. It's also right where the river comes nearest. And there's this town, it's called Babylon. And this town is growing, and it's growing fast. And it is going to be a new kind of city. It's the first cosmopolitan city. Now, what does cosmopolitan mean? Well, it literally means universal city. Everyone lives there. It means a city of the universe. Cosmo is universe. Paul is city in Greek. And Itian is of the... It means a city of the universe. So who lives there? Everybody lives there. So what kind of city is this? How can everybody in Mesopotamia, how can everybody in the world, all these different cultures live there? Well, it's not based on farming anymore. It's, it's outgrown farming. It's gotten too big for farming. It can't support itself on farming. It has to import food. It's based on trade. It's based on making stuff. Now, Babylon turns out to be a natural place for people to get together in Mesopotamia, and there will always be a large city there. It'll be Babylon. It'll be Ctesiphon, the Greek city. It'll be Baghdad. There's always a capital city in Mesopotamia where Babylon is. Why? It's because it's a natural place for people to gather. It's halfway up the river. It's halfway down the river from where the big cities are. Remember, on the map, it may look like, oh, look, those rivers go longer, but a quarter of that is mountains. And then a lot of that is a Syrian, what will later be called Assyria, but it's frontier. It's cities that are so small, there's not much out there. It's like, you know, Northern Nevada. And so it's, it's halfway up and down and where the rivers come closest, it's a natural place if you want to trade to go, to meet with people. And so what is the effects of being cosmopolitan? This first kind of cosmopolitan city. Now, remember, there's not many cities. Now, we use cosmopolitan way differently than how uh, in English than what I mean. Cosmopolitan becomes the mean sophisticated. I'm cosmopolitan. It's a kind of drink. But what cosmopolitan really means is a diverse city. And there are very few of them in the world today. In the world, there's only two, New York and London. In the ancient world, there was Babylon. There's usually only one or two. Then it was Alexandria. Then it was Rome. Then there wasn't one. And you go, well, what about these other cities? What about Chinese cities that are big? Well, they're big, but 95% of the people who live there are Han Chinese. Tokyo is huge. 92% of the people who live there are Japanese. That's a sophisticated city, but it's not cosmopolitan. Whereas New York and London, 40% of the people who live there are foreigners. They're not Americans. They're not British. 
That's not even to talk about race. Let's just talk about region of origin. And so big cosmopolitan cities are rare and they're rare for a very easy reason. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's, they're rare. So let's talk about the advantages first. First, it's huge. Cosmopolitan cities are huge. London is huge. New York is huge. New York is, is, the, is the largest city in America and has been for almost the entire, since it replaced Philadelphia. Um, and what it brings is diversity. But Babylon was huge on an order that people couldn't understand. It had 250,000 people in it. When Ur and Uruk were super cities at 30,000. And a typical city was less than 5,000. So a typical city was like a college town in America today. Ur and Uruk were like Buffalo or Indianapolis. Large, like like 100,000 people, kind of relatively small. Whereas Babylon was New York, was massive. Babylon, uh, New York, just to give you an idea, New York is five times the size of Philadelphia and its, and its suburbs. Five times. That's how big New York is. So you have all these different people. And so... Your, the effects are you get size and that size creates money and that money will create military power and it will create opportunities for people because people need stuff. It also creates knowledge and culture because people have money. So they'll buy education for their kids. They'll buy stories and plays. They'll buy entertainment. But it also costs money. There's huge competition you're not the only blacksmith anymore. There's 12 blacksmiths and those 12 blacksmiths might be better than you. To make all your stuff, you need resources which aren't in the region. You want metal? You got to go up to the mountains where the Hittites are. So you need a resource requirement. So Babylon's size becomes a natural intake for both talent and an exhalation of ideas. People come into it and they leave it. It's immense. It's a huge opportunity to go to and then in too expensive to stay in. And so it kind of sucks people in and then it kicks them out, it exhales them as they go back to small towns to leave that competition behind, to retire. But it's like New York. In this case, it's like LA, sucking people from the Midwest. Like, you want to be an actor? You don't stay in St. Louis. You go to New York or L.A. if you want to make it. Where are the best schools? They're on the coast. The Northeast, California. So they become natural intakes of talent. And Babylon, because of all this cultural diversity, because of all this money, because of all this tumult, becomes the most advanced place on earth. It is the smartest place on earth because it, it's bringing all these people's ideas and they're sharing very easily. You're a blacksmith, right? How good do you have to be? You have to be at least as good as the people who are in Babylon. Well, at home, in a small town of 5,000 people, you were the best blacksmith because you were the only one. But now you want to make money. So what do you do? You go to Babylon. Well, now there's 12 blacksmiths, right? And you take a look at how they, they work because you want to see your competition. And you see them, doom, doom, doom. They're doing double-handed hammering. And you're like, oh my God, I can't do that. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do that. Oh, they're melting metal together that I've never seen before. How do they do that? What's this technique? Like, you can't open a shop. No one would go to you or only the poorest people would go to you because your, your creations would not be as good. So what do you have to do? You have to get better. Well, you could do it one of two ways. You either experiment until you figure it out yourself, but that takes a lot of time. And that's time you're not making money. Or you do what you students are doing. 
you pay somebody else who's smarter than you to be a shortcut, to tell you what you need to know. And that's this class. This class is 5,000 years of history. Could you figure it all out? Could you do it all your own? Yes. You could spend the money on the textbook. You could use Wikipedia. You could use encyclopedias. You can go and hit lots of books and lectures and, and mountains of great courses. You could do all that. Or you could take the 15, the 25 years I've taken to do that. And you could just pay me and ask me, what do you need to know? And I'll say, all right, I'll take my knowledge and boom, here's a history 101 course. I'll take my 20 years of experience, my 20 years of study, my 20 years of learning about this stuff and explaining it to people. And I'll just tell you what you need to know. And so then you can go on with the shortcut of having learned all the stuff you need to know about History 101 without having to take the 15 years to learn it. Boom, gone, moving on. And then you could start your own thing. And so what Babylon does is this constant tumult, this constant sharing of ideas. So it becomes the most advanced place on earth. What are the advantages of this, this diversity? Well, or, or advantages of Babylon. Well, diversity is the lots of ideas, the new knowledge, the experimentation, exactly what we just talked about. And so you get cuneiform, the first form of writing that allows for records. It allows you to pass down knowledge to generations. You have all this knowledge, you need to share it. And so they invent a way of sharing it. And that's pictorial language. This isn't an alphabet, it's pictures that stand in for things. Think like hieroglyphics. Though hieroglyphics is not pictures standing in for things, it's actually an alphabet. But it's more complicated, but it's a pictorial alphabet. It's complicated. But cuneiform allows for the passing down of knowledge to generations. I can read Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was written in, ba in, in cuneiform and it's been passed down ever since. So, ba so Gilgamesh is written in 2500 BC. I can read it today. I can read something from 2500 years ago. I need to know the language or I need to get a translation from somebody who does know the language, but I could read that. That's a huge, huge, like you can't, writing is the most important invention humans ever invented. It just is next to language, spoken language. Though you'd make the argument that language isn't an invention, it's biological, but that's a whole different thing. But cuneiform is, is writing is an invention. You don't naturally write. You do naturally learn to communicate. You see little babies, they learn, they figure it out. They start working on words and, but you don't have to learn to write. Most people in the history of the world were illiterate. They didn't know how to read and write. And so writing allows for the passing down of knowledge. You also get things that allow you to be better farmers or better workers. The lunar calendar invents time and allows for better farming. Why? Because it tells you when the better time to farm is. It just happened this year. We, were, we entered in March. It got warm. It was suddenly 60 degrees. That's great. Oh, and then it was 20 degrees. And for two weeks, it was in the 20s. Well, if you had 60 degree weather and you thought, oh, I'm going to go farm and then drop down to the 20s, which is like minus 10 if you're Celsius, you just froze your land. You just froze all your seeds. You just killed your harvest. Congratulations. What the lunar calendar does is say, wait to the third full moon it'll be warm by then. It'll be constantly warm by then. Wait to the sixth full moon until you harvest because you can't harvest wheat too soon. Then you can't eat it. But if you harvest it too late, again, you can't eat it. And so it allows for better farming by inventing time, by inventing schedules, by inventing a rhythm and passing that down. You also get bronze. 
the melting of these metals together, copper and tin. It allows for better tools, better weapons, allows for more efficient work, and allows for more wealth because you're, you are now able to farm more land, farm it more efficiently, more densely, because you now have better tools. And all of this is this diversity of mixing. What is the disadvantage of Babylon? Well, diversity. It's too many people. And they all think they're right. They all think the way they live is right. They all think what they eat is right. They all think their language is the best. There's too many languages. How do you speak to each other? There's too many gods, which God is right. Foods, rules, traditions. There's all this mix. And there's a constant cultural competition for who's better, for who's right. And so a heterogeneous society, New York always looks like it's falling apart. It always looks crazy to outsiders. To New Yorkers, that's part of its charm. It's supposed to look crazy. There's a, there is an infrastructure in this. But to outsiders, you go, oh my God, how do these people live together without killing each other? That's the Tower of Babel story. That's the Hebrew story of Babylon. Now, the Hebrews don't come along to much later, till after the Bronze Age collapse. So we're talking 2,000 years later, give or take. Though so they're, they're around earlier, but these are st the Tower of Babel story is not written down to around 600, 500 BCE. And it talks about Babylon like, like it's Vegas, with horror, but also a bit of jealousy. Because there's so much sin, there's so many people, they build too big. The Tower of Babel can knock on God's front door. It's too much. But remember, you came from Judea, which had all small towns except for one, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem had nothing that was anywhere close to as big as what was being built in Babylon. 98% of the people were Hebrew. They spoke Hebrew. They worshiped the Hebrew God. You go to Babylon and it's this mess of people. Every street is new people. Every corner is a new language. And you're horrified by that, but also enticed because they have money and they have energy and they have all these new inventions and they built something enormous. So Every story of Babylon is, has these two sides to it. Every story in the Old Testament about Babylon is both a horrible, it's horrified that these people exist, that this place of sin exists, but also a bit jealous of it too. Look at all the stuff they have. Look at what they can do. Now, the most popular story the universal story that everyone will read, that everyone will share, it's the story of Gilgamesh. It is the first or oldest written down story. It is extreme. Everybody in Mesopotamia will read it. It will make its way into the holy books of the Quran and the Old Testament. It is everywhere. The, these Babylonian influences. Every society will read it. It's, it's, it's Homer to the Greeks. Every Greek will read Homer. Every educated Greek will carry Homer with them somewhere on their bookshelf. Every educated Mesopotamian had Gilgamesh, read Gilgamesh. It was extremely popular. It had universal themes. Every society uses it. So every Mesopotamian society has a flood story that kills everybody, that commits a genocide, that wipes out the world. The Noah biblical story is written 1,500 years after Gilgamesh. Now, it's based on an older story, yes, but it's not written down for 1,500 years. That's how popular Gilgamesh is. 2,000 years later, imagine 2,000 years later, people still living, listening to Taylor Swift, right? Or in sync's Bye, 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 Bye. 2,000 years from now, that's Gilgamesh. 
So what does it talk about? It talks about what are the qualities of a good king? Because Gilgamesh isn't one. The first introduction is the people complaining to the gods, save us from Gilgamesh. He's violent. He rapes our daughters. He's a terrible king. Why did you send him to us? Can't you get rid of him? And so the gods are like, we'll do something about that. And what they do is send Enkidu. They make a person who is not urban, who does not live in the city. They make a noble savage. They make a guy who lives outside the city. So the second theme, now Enkidu is going to, part of what he's going to do is show Gilgamesh by being different and yet being very similar to Gilgamesh what it's like, what you should act like, what you should, you shouldn't rape all the teenage girls that you meet. You just shouldn't. And you think, oh, that's horrible, but lots of kings will do this. Um, uh, in in, in ba Baghdad, in Babylon, um, one of the things of when, we, when the United States invaded Iraq in 2002, 2003, was one of the sons of um, Saddam Hussein was known to do exactly this. He built an Olympic gymnast team, the Iraqi Olympic gymnast team, female gymnast team, to basically be a place that people would send their girls to and he would just rape them. So when the Americans invaded Iraq in 2002, 2003, people turned him over. They didn't sell out Saddam, but his son, they were perfectly fine turning him over to the Americans. And he, why? Because he was a bad ruler. He was a bad guy, just like Gilgamesh was. The second theme is urban living is not natural. This is the first story. You should understand this. This is the first story humans write down and they're already complaining about living in cities. This is a theme that will go all the way to the modern age. It will go all the way to Republicans. It will go all the way to, to, to Sarah Palin in 2008. I remember watching this speech in rural North Carolina, getting on stage and going, I am so glad to be in real America with real Americans. In rural North Carolina? What does that tell, tell you? It tells you the people that what she thought and her political party thought and the people in the audience thought, because they cheered, were better than the people of New York who are mixtures, who are foreigners, who are Jews, who are homosexuals, or the liberals out in California, in, in LA, that somehow living in a city wasn't natural. Freud will write a book civilization and its discontents. Plato will write about the Republic as a power, as a, as a perfect society saying no city should be bigger than 10,000 people. Now he lived in Athens, which was the size of Babylon. Now this is two 2,500 years later, but he knew what he was writing about. And he says, Oh, it should only be 10,000 people because everyone still knows each other at 10,000. So, the ideal city should be a college town, according to Plato. So from the very beginning of people living in cities, people have complained about living in cities. It's too noisy. It's too many people. It's too big. It's too expensive. People have always complained about living in cities. And Enkidu is the noble savage. He's a guy who isn't tainted by civilization. He, he's not the smarty guy who went to university. He's not wearing the finest clothes. He's a guy who's real. He's the rural hillbilly who's wise. He's what's his name in um, Walking Dead, the guy with the crossbow, Dale. He's, he's got all, he doesn't have any of the sophistication, but he's the real hero. That's Enkidu. And finally, we get the flood. There's a flood, and it wipes out 99% of life on Earth. It's brought by the gods. And so, what is the flood telling you? It's one telling you that the gods don't like you, that gods are pernicious, the gods are mean, and that you could die at any time. The gods can kill you at any time. Your life is not, you're not special, is what the flood tells you. 
The second thing is, is ask the question, why do we die? Why do we have to die? Because dying sucks. Gilgamesh is king of the world and he's going to die, which means he's not going to be king anymore. <clears throat> and so he doesn't want to die because dying sucks. His friend Enkidu dies and he's like, this sucks. I don't want to die. I don't want my friends to die. And so he asks, what is the meaning of life? What does life mean if you die? And how do you live forever? And so he seeks out a way of living forever. And he doesn't achieve it. So what is the answer? The answer is you live forever in the stories that are told about you. And this will become kind of the method of great men. Alexander will think this too. You, 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 you leave stories behind and the stories about you live forever. So we are still talking about Gilgamesh 2,500 years later. So he's living forever. We talk about Alexander. We will talk about him forever. Or for, you know, we talk about him for, uh, well, we've talked about Gilgamesh for 4,000 years because he's 2,500 BC. We've talked about Gil Alexander for 2,500 years, right? 2,000 years plus 300. So how do you live forever? But most people cannot be Alexander. Most people cannot be Gilgamesh. So how do you live forever? Through your children. You live forever through your children because you have children. You tell your children the stories of your life. And when you die, your children tell their children the story of grandpa. And that's what happens. You live longer through your children, through the stories of your children. So we still, I, and I'm sure you, if you haven't lost your grandparents yet, this will happen. For those of you who have lost your parents or your or your um, grandparents, I'm sure this has happened where you get together with your brothers and sisters or you get together with your cousins. And what do you do? You you talk and you go, oh, how are your kids? And uh, you talk about the loud stuff. And sooner or later, especially if there's alcohol involved, you, you, you remember where grandpa, grandpa used to smoke camels. You know, someone takes out a camel to smoke and uh, they go, oh, grandpa always smoked camels. Well, yeah, I know. Remember, he used to be in the workshop and and you start telling stories about grandpa. That means grandpa st is still alive. Grandpa is alive in those stories. So you live forever in those stories. So what should you do? Well, Gilgamesh would tell you have children and have grandchildren. Also, write diaries. Write down your life. Write stories so that you can pass them on. And that will help. <sighs> All right. Babylon grows so big, it has a problem. And that problem is going to be solved by Hammurabi, the lawgiver, in around 1750 BC. He is not the first king of Babylon. He's like the sixth king. So it, notice Babylon grows. And by the time you get to Hammurabi, six kings in, He's got a problem, and that problem is size. His problem is diversity. We talk about, sometimes we talk about diversity as a, as a positive, and it is. And we talked about po diversity as a positive right in this class, earlier in this lecture. It's not always a positive. It also brings with it all of the heterogeneous problems that people don't speak the same language. They don't have the same values. They don't have the same culture. They don't get along. So how do you get 250,000 people who have no cultural unity to live together? And that's Hammurabi. Hammurabi is going to create the law code, the first written down law code, Hammurabi's code. And what does it declare? It declares the king makes the rules. Which culture is right? The king's culture. Which law is right? The king's law. Which values are correct? The king's values. You don't like it? Leave. Get the F out. It's written down so that it doesn't change. It's not malleable. It's not a living law. The Bible is the same way. The Old Testament is the same way. The laws are written down in stone and they've never changed. Now we'll talk about how that's a problem when we get to the Hebrews. We're not going to worry about it here. But that the laws don't change is going to be a problem because societies do change. But that's a, going to be a bigger problem when you get to monotheism. 
but it's written down. These aren't malleable. They're also, you could refer to them. You could say number six is what I'm talking about. Number six is the one that dude broke. I want restitution for number six so that it's available to people by being written down. Two, punishment equaled social rank. There's a math to Hammurabi's code. Who you are multiplied by what you did divided by who you did it to. Who you are multiplied, so it depends on who you are, who's doing the crime, multiplied by what you did. So the worse the thing you did, the worse the punishment will be, but divided by who you did it to. So it matters who you did this crime to. And so we get this kind of complicated thing, but it's not really complicated because you already know half of it. It's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you're of the same social status, but if you're of different, but there's different punishments if you're of different social statuses. So you know this, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, probably from the Old Testament, probably from the Bible, maybe from the Quran. But it leaves out the if part. Because all Hebrews were the same status before Yahweh, before their God, even though we kind of drop it, but in the Old Testament, it does talk about how there are punishments for slaves and foreigners, and those punishments are worse. But the the idea is very simple. I'm a nobleman. I get into a fight. I punch the guy in the face. I punch out his two front teeth. I did something wrong. What is my punishment? Well, that depends on who I punched. If I punched a fellow nobleman, well, then I will lose these same exact teeth. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The same thing, not more, not less. So it's equal retribution. Why? Because we are of the same social status. We are the same value in society. But what if I punch the face of a slave? A slave isn't worth as much as me. No, a slave has value because a slave is worth money. You could sell a slave. A slave does work. So punching out the teeth of a slave makes that slave worth less. So what do I do? I pay money. I pay restitution. $100 a tooth. I don't give it to the slave. I give it to the slave's owner, but I pay $100 a tooth. I do not lose my teeth. Why? Because I'm a nobleman. I'm not going to lose my teeth over a slave. Come on. That's not serious. I am worth more than a slave. My teeth are worth way more than a slave's tooth. So it makes no sense. And nobody thinks that it's equal. There there isn't even a word equality in Babylonian. What if I punch out a citizen's teeth? Some dude I met in a bar. We got into a fight over who's better, LeBron or Jordan. Well, he's worth more than a slave, but not worth as much as a nobleman. So what should happen? I have to pay. What do I pay? Well, a slave's tooth is worth 100 bucks, so I pay 200 bucks per tooth. He gets more money. Now, what if a citizen, what if a citizen punches out my two front teeth? Well, he's going to lose all of his teeth. What if a slave does it? Well, you're going to kill the slave. You murder the slave. Why? Cuz you can't tell, you can't allow slaves to think they could get away with hurting noblemen. There's not enough noblemen. There's only 2% of the population is nobility. And they have the wealth and they have, they're in charge. So if slaves think they could hurt a nobleman, they might revolt. So you're going to kill the slave. The citizen loses all of their teeth. They don't die, but they don't only lose two teeth. And so who you are depends on your punishment. The advantage of this is that everybody has the same rules and they know what they are because they're written down. And this all makes sense, right? Noblemen are worth more than citizens and slaves. There's no concept of equality. No one goes, oh, that's not equal because there's no concept of equality. They don't live in a world of equality. They live in a world where the nobility are better and the slaves are worse. So of course the rules would treat them differently. Of course. Why wouldn't it? If you have, you've done this, you have lived in this, this is one of the glories of the Code of Hammurabi, is it really does take how people work and how people naturally think, right? 
Because look at it. You raise children. Any of you who are parents, any of you who have an older brother or a younger sister know this, right? Because you've all had this fight. So you've gone to your parents. You're the middle child, right? You're the second child. And you go to your mom and dad and go, why does the older brother, why does Billy get to stay out late, later than me? And the answer is, well, he's, they'll tell you, well, he's older. Like, that's not fair. And they're like, you're not equal. You're not, you are 12. He is 17. He is allowed to stay out later than nine o'clock. He is 22. And you are eight. You are not allowed to go out. You're not equal. And nobody thinks a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old are equal. They don't, nobody thinks they're the same. Except the 10-year-old who's like, I don't get to do cool things. I have to be home by dinner. And he, the older brother, gets to stay out till midnight. That's not fair. He gets to stay home alone. That's not fair. He gets to go driving. That's not fair. Why don't I get to drive? But all parents, you know, they're not equal. There's no concept of equality between your children. And you're like, one day you'll get to do it. But right now, he's older and you are younger. There's no equality. There's no concept of equality. So that's the Code of Hammurabi. Nobody thinks nobility and citizens and slaves should be treated exactly the same. Nobody in the ancient world at this point two the rich do get punished and that's a good thing for the first time in a first society they get punished while the rich get protected the poor know not to mess with the rich so everyone gets something out of this see before if the rich hurt you right you own a farm next to a rich dude's farm right and the rich dude's kid comes and kills your pigs for giggles for the lulls. All right. Well, that pig is worth a thousand, ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars to you. Let's call it five thousand dollars, right? You now out five thousand dollars, but you can't go beat up the the son of a rich kid. Then that rich dude is going to come and have you beaten up by his his bodyguards. So what do you do? Well, you go and you knock on the front door and go, "Your kid killed my pig. I want money." Okay, who did you just say that to? You said it to the doorman who is in front of, if they happen to answer the door, a bodyguard carrying a weapon. What is the likelihood of you ever getting to meet the rich dude and then him signing the check for $5,000? It's zero. It's not going to happen. The Code of Hammurabi made it happen. The Code of Hammurabi gave you someone to go to, the law court the king, and go, that rich dude's neighbor, son killed my pig. And right here in law number 38, it says if a rich dude kills the animal of a farmer, the farmer will, be, will get a pig back. Plus $100. So I want my new pig and I want $100. And it's, and the law court which is made up of other rich dudes, it's true, but we'll turn to the rich dude and say, is this true? And it's like, well, you know, Joey does things. It's like, well, you're going to pay the pig and you're going to give them the $100 because that's what law number 32 says and you're going to do it. And the rich dude goes, oh, really? And he goes, yes, you're going to do it or we have to kick this up to Hammurabi. And he goes, oh, 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 I don't want that. You're, all right, all right, all right, go get the pig. And it's got to be a good pig. Don't get a bad pig. Get a good pig. Let the dude pick out a pig. Because it has to be equal to the pig that was killed. Now, if the son killed the pig of a noble person, it would be a bigger thing, right? It'd be five pigs plus $5,000 extra. You know, it would be a bigger thing. And slaves don't own pigs because slaves don't own property. But for the first time, the rich get punished. The poor get some protection, but also the rich get protection from the poor. The poor know don't mess with the rich because your punishment will be worse. Three, kings now have a new power, the lawgiver. They're not only a conqueror, 
than not only a protector in walls, they're now a lawgiver, a new form of protection, actually. But they're now the lawgiver. And in, in, our, in the freeze, in the ceiling of the Supreme Court, we have 10 lawgivers, the 10 great lawgivers of history, 10 mythological, 10 ancient, and 10 modern, carved into the Supreme Court, looking down at the justices. So the lawgiver is a major form of legitimacy, one who brings justice to the people. And they have the legitimacy to enforce it. Look, they, they create the courts, they create the judges, because the, the king can't do all, can't do all of this, all of these petitions. People doing crazy stuff all the time. So he has to have people designated for different parts of the city to deal with. So you get your, what we would call a circuit court. And you get an appeals court later on. Like, if you think that judge was wrong, you get an appeals court where you go to another judge. Remember, all these judges are noblemen, so... And if you're nobility, you could always appeal to the king, right? Because you're the whole, you're the king's homeboy. This equaled success. Everyone uses this. Everyone in Mesopotamia uses it. It's all over your Old Testament. Check out your Old Testament. You see this all over the place. It is everywhere. Everybody uses it. This is the way law works in the world until the Romans basically come along and create something that looks like our system. Where you make an argument, you have you have you have judges, you have juries, you have defense clients, and you have uh, prosecution, and it's antagonistic. Like until you get the the Roman concept of just judicial review, this is the way it worked. What about women? Women are a problem. Women are always going to be a problem in our societies because. No one wants to punish women like men. Women are not the same as men. And so when they make the rules about all the men, they go, oh, what do we do about the women? So women are always a problem because they figure out the rules for the men and they go, ah, we solve the world. Oh, wait, we have to, what about women? Women do bad things sometimes, but nobody wants to punch out the teeth of women. Nobody wants to, to punish them like men. We now in 2020, 2021, 2025, we don't want to punish women the same as men, and we don't. Women do not serve the same amount of time for crimes as men do. Women do not serve as harsh a punishment. Women's prisons are, are terrible, but still not as awful as men's prisons. And they serve less time for the same crimes than men do. Nobody wants to punish men as, as badly. Just We don't. We just don't. So what do you do with women? Well, you treat them like children. We have a group of people who do wrong things who we don't want to punish. Those are children. And so we're going to treat women like children. They are not property. This is an idea that got started, I don't know when, but it became very big in feminist arguments in the 60s and the 70s that women had no rights. And so they were like property, but they're not. Women are not property. I cannot, in ancient Babylon, sell my wife like I could my land, like I could my ownership. They're children. They are not responsible for their actions. But they also have an important role in society. They need protections. I'll give you an example. I mean, some of you, if you work in retail, you know you've had this happen or something similar to this happen. You work at a store, that store sells ladies' undergarments, ladies' underwear, right? You work in Victoria's Secrets. A woman comes in with her two-year-old child, three-year-old child. And that child has an accident, pees on some of the women's underwear. Well, what do you do? Do you call the cops? You go, oh my God, this child has destroyed property and been creepy about it. No. You tell your manager and your manager says, well, go get a mop. And then the manager goes to the woman and says, we need to talk about this. Right? Nobody is calling the cops on the kid. Now, replace that child, that three-year-old child, who is not responsible for their action. You're like, oh, it's a three-year-old. What are you going to do? Right? 
Replace it with a 33-year-old man in a long coat, right? He comes in and he pees on the women's undergarments. You call the cops on that guy because he's doing something weird and it's weird, right? And you call the cops on that guy. Why? The child is not responsible. Nobody thinks the child is responsible, but the man is. He's an adult man. He should know better. He is responsible. And so women get treated like children. They're not property. I can't sell them. I can't beat my wife. You go, oh, well, you could beat your wife. Not really. Why? My wife doesn't cook the food I want, right? I, I'm mad about it. She's, 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 she snaps back at me. She talks back. So I punch her in the face, right? So she gets a black eye. And I said, don't do that again, right? So I'm all man now, right? Show my woman who's boss. What is she going to do? Well, in a day or two, she's going to go and see her mother with that black eye. She's going to have dinner with her mom. She's going to see her sister. And then what's the mom going to ask? What the hell happened? Well, he hit me in the face. Why? Well, I burnt, burnt the, the sausages. What's the mom going to do? One of two things. Maybe she goes, well, don't burn the fucking sausages. You know, be a better woman. Be a better wife. You deserved it. That is one thing they may do. More likely, they're going to call in her husband. Carl, Carl, come in here. And Carl's going to come in. And Carl's going to see the black eye and go, whoa, 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 honey, what happened? Well, my husband hit me. Why? I burnt the sausages. And he's going to do one of two things. He's going to say, well, don't burn the sausages. But more likely, he's going to say, whoa, hey, boys, boys, get in here. And in come the three brothers. They're going to come in. Take a look at your sister. Take a look at what your brother-in-law did to your sister. Well, did she deserve it? No, she burned some sausages. Oh, that's not deserving that. Yeah, no. I mean, a, a reprimand, a talking to, sure. Don't burn the sausages. I mean, sausages are expensive. But hitting, no, no, no. And they're going to, and so what's going to happen? At 3 a.m., I'm going to get a knock on my door. And I'm going to open the door. It's going to be my three brothers. My three brothers-in-law. Who are going to be like, yo, bro, we were in the neighborhood. Come for, a, come for a drink with us. Do I say no? I can't say no. They're my brothers-in-law. So I, of course, say yes. So we go. And we have drinks. And I notice, or maybe not, that I'm having two drinks to every one that they're finishing. They're buying, of course, all the rounds. And then when I can't really see straight, and there's now six brothers, they beat the snot out of me. And they tell me, if you ever hit our sister again, we are going to destroy you. We can find our sister a new husband. That ain't hard. And so there's this, this limits on how men can behave. Now, women who do not have family protections, who do not have fathers, who do not have brothers, they are more vulnerable to the violence of men. But women are never property. That does not mean they have rights. That does not mean they're citizens. They're children. In most societies. I'm not saying all societies. Property would be a slave. My wife is not a slave. My wife is not my slave. In any legal concept in the ancient world, in Greece, in Rome, in Babylon, my wife is not my slave. My wife is in need of protections because she has an important role in society. So what does that effect have on women? If women are considered children and they're not responsible for their actions, they can't be punished as harshly as men. But it also means women are not independent. They are a ward of their father. They are a ward of their husband. There is a man who is in charge of them, of their money, of their, of their actions. So why my wife does something wrong, and this happened in Victorian England with the start of like department stores, that women would be walking out late at night, you know, after dark, and they weren't supposed to. Only, only street walkers, i.e. prostitutes, were supposed to be out on the streets at night. And so the cops would arrest these women who had just left the department store. And they'd bring them home. 
and he knock on the door and the husband opens the door with his little miss you know very well made mustache and his suit and his vest and he goes what's the matter officer and go why did you let your wife outside at night do you not know how dangerous this is and who gets in trouble the man gets in trouble not the woman because women are silly like a child who got out who snuck out or a dog who jumped the fence that's a woman out at night that's a wife out at night not responsible for our actions but who's going to get in trouble the husband's going to get in trouble and don't make us come back if you can't control your wife we're going to have to do something and the husband's like all right i will take care of my wife i will give her a good talking to i will send her to bed without her supper well okay well we don't get too mean about it like you know we just we worry about our women we don't want them out at night you know with the uh, with the nefarious types you know how men are so the effect is there's a man in charge of a woman now now remember in nomadic societies that didn't happen women were independent they had control over their bodies now they don't women are not independent they have lost their independence <clears throat> but they gain legal protections of being a wife, a mother. This role is now quantified. They have a legal right to being a wife and a mother. So they have a say in marriage. Their virginity gives them possession of their body. There are actually several laws about protecting a woman's virginity. That if a man lies, a man steals it, man rapes, bad things happen to that guy and the woman is quote literally quote blameless it's not her fault so even in the oldest law code ever invented we didn't blame women for rape so we've actually gone backward we've gone before the law code of Hammurabi did not go well what was she wearing why was she there you know she shouldn't have been there later no it didn't it said, if she was raped, the man is at fault. Now, would women be allowed at the bar late at night? Not by husbands or fathers, not by responsible husbands or fathers. But there was also the idea that a woman has still had possession of her body through her virginity. She gained a dowry. Fathers had to give the husband a lump sum of money. And that money was for her to use now it was in a bank account under his name but it was for her money so if she wanted to buy something and she wanted to take a little vacation she wanted to come and see her mother and it's like well you have to you have to hire a taxi she had the money to do it she wasn't completely relying on her husband and if they got divorced she got that money back but remember she's a child and so that money is in the bank under his name and you go well that's crazy but it's not that crazy and the reason why is my mother in the 70s, when she applied for a credit card, had to have my father sign on as a responsible person in case my mom did not pay the money back. For a woman in the 60s and the 70s to get a credit card, a white woman, a white middle class, upper middle class woman to get a credit card, she had to have a bank account and her husband's signature on both. They had to know that they could get the money from the man because they didn't think women would be responsible with the credit card. They would just go and buy lots of shit. So here we are, four, 5,000 years later, and we're still treating women economically more or less the same way. And finally, there's a limitation on male behavior. By making, by protecting women's role as wife and mother, you limit what men can do. And you go, well, how does that limit men, what men can do? Well, I can't do trade. I can't go to war if my wife doesn't have children. Why? Because the king says, oh, we're going to go fight the Hittites. Come, make some money. And I go, great, I'm going to go join the king. Uh, where are the Hittites? Well, they're up the river. It's going to take a year to get there. We're going to fight and then a year to get back. And I go, I can't go. And they go, why can't you go? It's like, well, my wife doesn't have a child yet. I have no children. She has a right to have children. And she will tell you that. She will be like, you can't go. What do you mean I can't go? 
You got to get me preggers. I got to have children. If you go, that's two years. Two years I'm not having children. That's a lot of time. And if you're a father, you have to marry your daughter. Your daughter has a right to get married. And so this is like kind of Capulet in Romeo and Juliet. When Paris comes to Capulet and it's like, I want to marry your daughter. And Capulet's like, I don't know. I like having her around. Like Capulet's job is to marry his daughter. She has to be allowed to get married. Now, what father wants their daughter to have, you know, lots of sex? None. None. They're like, no, let her stay home. I'd be very happy if she stays home. And I like having her around. Very, what Capulet says, right? But the law says she has a right to be an adult. She has a right to be a wife. So it's your job to help her be one. So you have to do it. It's your job as a man to have sex with your wife. Which means you can't go to war. You can't go to Egypt and take two years to go do a trade embassy. You got to have sex with your wife. And your wife can say, he's not having sex with me. He's not getting me pregnant. I want a divorce. She has every right to have children. And the law says, yeah, she has a right to have children. So women's job is to be a wife and a mother. So it's very constricted what they can do. But they have those rights and those rights do limit men's behavior. They do put limitations on men. So again, women are not property. They are children, but they're not property. And that is the end of Babylon and Mesopotamia. We did a lot today. So thank you. Be safe. Take care.